Good morning, everyone. You are joining the Meet the Team Santa Ana webinar. This is part of the ANA Avatar X Prize, which is a $10 million competition focused on the creation of a robotic avatar system that will enable the operator to, to uh, interact within a remote environment and in a way that as if that, that person was truly there. So we're meeting today with uh, Team Santa Ana from Pisa, Italy. And they're one of 77 qualified teams in this competition that are working toward the realization of an avatar system. I want to turn things over now to the team leader of the Santa Ana team. His name is Antonio Frisoli, and he's going to give us an introduction to his team and uh, the, the equipment that they're working on. So Antonio. My Hello, chair. everyone. Hello, colleagues. So we are live from uh, Scuola Sant'Anna. Uh, we are in particular now hosting the meeting in um, Perceptor Robotics Laboratory. Uh, and we have all team components and members here uh, today. So my name is Antonio Frisoli and I'm the team leader uh, for this team uh, that uh, gathers several uh, researchers and professors from Scuola and uh, two companies. Uh, uh, Prensilia and wearable robotics. And uh, I, I'd like to um, introduce uh, the other member of the teams. Uh, so I'm uh, a professor in the Scuola Sant'Anna in uh, robotics. And we have a, a long tradition uh, in the area of exoskeleton, haptic interface and teleoperation. And so we believe that uh, we can bring uh, an interesting contribution in uh, this uh, um, competition. And uh, as a second person, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Marco Controzzi, that is uh, from the Artificial Hands area. Marco, please, you can introduce yourself. I, I cannot hear you. You, have, you are muted, I think. Awesome. Okay, yeah, hello everyone. Know. Yeah, okay. okay. Hello everyone. My name is Marco Controtti, I'm assistant professor of robotics at the Biorobotic Institute of the School of Superior Santana, and I'm working on the artificial hands area. So I represent here the parts related on the end effector of the system that are based on two artificial hands we developed in the last years. And we uh, basically we are focused on uh, prosthetic sense, so um, replacement of missing parts in, in body people that uh, suffer from amputation. But we um, we are confident that these hands are even powerful through uh, a teleoperation scenario, since there's uh, um, a very extensive sensory system and dexterous uh, capabilities. Thank okay. you very much, Marco. I forgot to say, of course, that we are, uh, Scuola Sant'Anna is placed in Pisa, in Tuscany, in the center of Italy. And uh, then uh, I'd like to introduce Francesco Porcini, that is uh, basically behind uh, the teleoperation architecture and overall setup. And I don't know whether uh, he can show up. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Francesco Porcini, a PhD student of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. I'm not sure if you can see me now in uh, the Daniele's camera. And uh, I'm here as an expert uh, with my expertise on the deliberation architecture. And uh, you can see behind me the, our uh, architecture of deliberation composed by the Master Exoskeleton Alex, which is now uh, guided by Massimiliano. And uh, on the left side, you can see our, uh, our slave device, which is uh, uh, composed by two UR5 manip manipulators and two hands, uh, of which uh, Marco was, uh, was talking about. And uh, we can have a demonstration of the movements of our setup. You can see uh, we have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going outside the camera so you can see the, the complete movement of the architecture. Uh, you can see that Massimiliano is moving the two arms with the movements of uh, its head arms. And uh, you can see the human-like movement of your five manipulators, the right side and the left one. You can also see he's controlling the clothing of the gripper uh, with uh, the pressure of, a, of an handle or on, the, on the arm of the exoskeleton. And in this configuration, our master device is, uh, is a, a seven degrees of freedom exoskeleton, which also allows him to 
feel uh, post feedback by the touch of, uh, of the remote environment. Mm -hmm. uh, in this moment, Massimiliano is showing just basic movements, uh, and this is our uh, most basic setup. So we, are, uh, we plan to complicate it in the course of time. Uh, Massimiliano can show also uh, experiments like uh, catching the ball and passing it through one end to another. So this task is uh, particularly complicated in this uh, uh, setup because Massimiliano cannot see the ball because uh, we are not using the camera of, uh, of the exoskeleton. So he's just seeing it by his side. It's not so simple because uh, he has uh, the UF5 which is covering the ball. He's now completing the task. It's not so simple. It's completely. Yeah. That was actually pretty impressive. The the actually the amount of grip strength it looked like it had just on the fingertips. Um, you know the grip that it had in the in the Mia hand on the right hand side was very strong, but the transfer uh, the transfer was very interesting because it was really just at the tips of the fingers, and I wasn't sure if it was going to hold or not. And that was a really interesting demonstration of the actual strength of the tips. Yeah. And, the and I can say also that this is not our best setup because he's not controlling all the fingers independently, but as one, but just by uh, pressing the handle. So this is not the best setup that we can achieve. Later, Daniele will demonstrate how we can control uh, uh, one finger to another finger with, with our hand exoskeleton, and also how to feel the pressure on the finger with the finger. So this is just a basic setup and our most mm -hmm. basic uh, uh, architecture. Yeah, that's so what I'm saying. Of course, this is uh, so only a demonstration of basic functionalities that we have available now and on the top of which we are building the avatar robot for the competition. So this is just a, a demonstration uh, on some of the components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. You know, and I, yes, please. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know if uh, Colin was saying something. No, I'm sorry, uh, Francesco. Were you going to mention something? No, nothing. Just, uh, just to say that uh, uh, in this architecture, we have just the basic movements as uh, an And this is just a demonstration of, uh, of human skills of our slave. And also the fact that uh, this task is in particular complicated because of the fact that uh, Massimiliano cannot see completely the environment. And because of the camera of the robot. But he also can, uh, can complete the task as you can see. Mm -hmm. Colin, I, I'd like to introduce also the fourth uh, member of the team, the fourth component of our team. And then uh, we will see in details all the, the demos. Uh, that represents uh, the contribution that we have from the students of the Scuola Sant'Anna because uh, our Scuola, we have a special status and uh, students are involved in, a lot in laboratory activities. And so we have the opportunity to involve a uh, lot of them in this competition. And there is Andrea Boscolo Camilletto that is connected on the first floor of, of the lab that can okay. introduce himself together with Luca. Can, can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. So here I am, I'm a master student in the robotics here at the Scuola Sant'Anna and uh, I'm leading uh, a team of uh, I think uh, 20, 25 uh, students that are working on, uh, on this project and uh, I'm here with uh, Luca and we are gonna show you the, the mobile part of the robot which is uh, an omni omni omnidirectional wheel-based robot that uh, we think is the best solution for uh, for the task we are, um, we are looking for, because you know it can uh, it can rotate without moving, moving and can move uh, without rotate, so it can it's the best fit for uh, for the task we are gonna we are looking uh, to achieve in uh, in the in the next month. So here we can see the only rotation part, and uh, maybe later we can show some more specific tasks we can uh, achieve with uh, with him. Now now we are controlling it with uh, with a joystick. But, uh, 
in some uh, in some months we we are going to implement the the slam navigation and uh, and all the rest uh, and all the rest. So I think that it's okay for us uh, as introduction. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, it looks like the that robotic base is moving really smoothly. Um, you know, well done on that build. That's something that you build custom. Is that correct? Or is it something? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's all, it's all custom. You. Yeah. Yes, completely custom. We we made it from scratch. We can we can say so. We we bought all the parts and we chose the motors and uh, and the gearboxes and uh, and the the frame. Uh, and all the electrical parts. So yeah, it's quite uh, quite new. It's brand new robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations! It looks really great and smooth and uh, smooth. And we're looking forward, obviously, to what you mentioned is fully integrating that. You know, with the system that we saw that uh, the fully the full tele tele robot system that we saw from Danielle's screen, and uh, putting that onto that mobile base and uh, creating that mobile avatar. So yeah. thank you for those introductions and uh, and those brief demonstrations. We're going to come back to those in a little bit um, and see a little bit more from each of from each of uh, each of those components. Um, I want to get a little bit of information from Antonio and maybe the rest of the team as well, who are welcome to chime in. Um, just a little bit about the story of Santa Ana, and you know. I'm, 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 my understanding is that the school is actually, you know, comes from a long lineage of, of really strong robotics. Antonio, can you tell us more about, um, you know, what, what, what kind of other programs or, uh, you know, tell us about uh, Santa Ana. Yeah, basically uh, in Italy is uh, uh, Santa Ana school has a special university status because we say that it is a school of excellence because we select uh, uh, top talent undergraduate students. And we are, uh, we have faculties in the uh, applied sciences. So engineering, uh, medicine, and then for social and humanities, we have, uh, of course, uh, law and um, political science uh, and economics. And uh, in engineering in particular, the two strong areas are uh, robotics and uh, photonics communications. Uh, robotics uh, and the AI in general. So we have also all the uh, computer science and embedded system department. And in particular, in uh, we think that uh, the that this challenge can uh, was able to involve a lot of components in the scuola, and uh, we consider also as an opportunity to work together to towards a common demonstrator of, of abilities because we have telematics uh, for the remote communication, uh, of course, uh, robotics, uh, and also all the real-time control, so uh, all the computer science uh, part. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, uh, in the Scuola, uh, we have all the, the graduate and the PhD programs, undergraduate and PhD programs, and we have a, a, a good number of PhD students that, uh, like, for instance, uh, Francesco is, is uh, that we are we have involved as well in in, in uh, inside the, the uh, this competition. Right. Thank you. So you have so you have a number of uh, different levels of students, graduate students, both undergraduate, and uh, you're also working with some faculty. Are there other crossovers from department to department, or is this really just in one area of the school that that your team is working on this Avatar X Prize project? Uh, oh yeah, probably I was not clear. Yes, uh, it is uh, already. Uh, I was saying that uh, I was just acting as coordinator, but as I was saying, Marco is representing an, a different area that is the artificial hands, uh, mm -hmm. and it comes from the Biorobotic Institute. Then Marco will tell a little bit about the story of bionics research and biorobotic research. We have a long tradition into that, and so this is a spin-off of this uh, technology in a different domain. And as I was saying, we also have uh, other faculties in the area of telecommunications and computer science. Uh, so I represent more the mechanical engineer and the more hardware uh, part. So we, we are now uh, more or less re representing uh, uh, four or five different uh, groups, uh, laboratories uh, in Scuola, plus some uh, uh, companies that are involved as well. Yeah. 
exactly. So, in particular, in our laboratory, that is Perceptor Robotics, we had a long tradition in the area of uh, telepresence, haptic interface, uh, so haptic feedback, and virtual reality. Uh, so this is like uh, the exoskeleton that we are using comes from uh, uh, research in which we developed several upper limb exoskeletons and we like to use this technology to provide haptic feedback to the operator. Mm. And uh, probably Marco can add something about the research yeah, the bionics, of bionics the, and biorobotics yeah. and something. Yeah, I'm representing the Biorobotic Institute, as I uh, told at the beginning of my introduction. And in the, the Biorobotic Institute, we, we basically develop uh, robotics for, for humans, uh, meaning that for robotics for rehab people or uh, prosthetics uh, systems. So uh, this bionic system that interface the human body to, to the machine. And uh, I'm part of this artificial hands area, so. Uh, we, we, we developed hands uh, since uh, the, um, 20 years ago, and um, he, here we are representing also the spin-off company Prensilia that uh, uh, commercialized our prototypes since 2009. And here, for, for instance, we, we are, uh, are presented two hands that uh, are uh, very new: the, the Azura hand that uh, it's on the left side of our a system that uh, is uh, a tendon with uh, hand with intrinsic attuation, meaning that all the functional components are in the sides of the hand itself, and it, the size is quite similar to the human hand. It's a tendon driven, so it's quite by inspired in, in this sense, and under attuated, meaning that there are less actuators than the uh, articulation joints in the, in the fingers. And as you uh, call him, um, appreciate during the demo uh, it, so the fingertips are uh, based on uh, the human pulp so there are compliant fingertips uh, uh, with the uh, inner bone inside and this allows to have a very uh, uh, wide grip on, on the object so you can steal all the object using a, a very uh, uh, low power force in the fingers and uh, uh, an extremity of the fingertips. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are sensors. So here there are a, sen a sensor in the fingertips. So these are a, a dual cantilever, uh, strange gauge based sensor. So we can uh, feel the force on the normal and tangential axis. Uh, and, and this is, I mean, concerned the Azura hand. While on the right side, of the system, we have a brand new Mia hand that looks, uh, I mean, different from, from the Azura hand because we, we work a lot on the cosmesis uh, uh, of this hand. So it's uh, uh, a waterproof hand, meaning that there are this glow that cover all the functional components that are inside of the hand. Uh, it's lighter respect the, 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 the Azura hand and it's more powerful. Uh, this hand can um, grasp an object with, with a force of uh, 70 newtons, so it's a quite large force compared to the other uh, robotic hands uh, that are commercially available. Um, and still, even if the size is very compact, it can perform uh, different grasp types. So uh, we have one motor that allows the independent flexion of the hinder fingers and the abduction of the thumb. This can uh, allows to, to, to switch from different grasps. For instance, this uh, is a lateral grasp that uh, it's useful for, uh, for instance, to, to, to grasp very tiny objects. Uh, while we can switch on the uh, um, digital grasp, uh, that they are precision grasp that can be used for, uh, for instance, for very small objects and precision manipulation. This is actually, uh, it's not, uh, this is a cylindrical grasp. Let's see if we, they're able to switch from another grasp. Okay, this is uh, the, the pH grasp, so we can manipulate very small objects and mm, perform uh, quite precise manipulation. And then there is the cylindrical grasp, that is, I mean, the power grasp that we can grasp objects, larger objects, okay? Even this hand comes with sensor inside, so we have a, a, a 
the actual sensor in the proximal phalanxes of the fingers uh, in the middle, uh, index middle and thumb, and we can feel the normal force and tangential force that can be used uh, after uh, there is a, a demo to, to, that we show you the optic uh, system that we are going to use. Okay, that, that's mostly all the things regarding the hands. Great, thank you for that demonstration. It's really great to get a walkthrough of those three different types of grips that are built into that hand. It's also an interesting feature that I'm not sure I'm too familiar with the, you know, the, or the waterproofing of that, where all the components are sealed in a way that would protect it from the elements to ensure that the hand is actually going to function at all times. Yeah. My understanding- Yeah, all the oh, yeah. Please, no, go ahead. Yeah, basically there are electronics and mechanical components that are here. There are a, a frame inside and then the glove here uh, allow for a waterproof connection in, in, this, in this wave. So there are a sort of O-ring here that can uh, close hold the hand against the water and uh, splash uh, from the outside. Yeah, that's a really critical design consideration also. You can, you can imagine that an avatar might be, you know, in any environment, truly. Um, you know, it could be in an environment where it is exposed to harmful elements that could inhibit the actual functioning of that system. And so having the hand, which is an important part of completing a lot of tasks, protected, allows it to really continue on in its functionality, regardless of that location. It's a really interesting Yeah, we, yeah, we, we discovered this... Uh, I mean, requirements from the prosthetic users. So people that use the uh, prosthetic hands would like to use the hand in a very ecological scenario. So you want to wash uh, dishes and everything, and so want to wash hands uh, and using the hands in a, a very strange scenario. So this is uh, uh, what we can, uh, I mean, deliver from the prosthetic field to the teleoperation field. Yeah, that's a and yeah, that's a great source of inspiration for that type of design because you know that's truly a human use case and having the prosthetics, which is something that's a clear demonstration of of using something you know in an everyday human sort of way, is a good analog for moving into the avatar space, which is a multi-purpose ro robot that's driven by a human, and so I think that's a really important thing to look at while you're considering how to con construct your hands and and what design considerations you may want to take into account. Yeah. So my understanding is that you also have a robotic gripper and I'm curious, you know, you may, the last time we spoke, I saw that the gripper was attached to that right arm. Um, can you tell me more about the gripper and when that might be, when that might be used? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the idea was to show basically the functionality of uh, haptic feedback that we can provide. And uh, in particular, I think now uh, Daniele can also show a demo. We can uh, probably have a close up on, on the system that is better to understand how it works. So I don't see. Yeah, yeah we are just moving a camera. Uh, five seconds. Okay, we are so in. I will keep talking. Just uh, here we are. So the idea that uh, we'll show Daniele is basically. Uh, the example of wearable haptics and the finger, finger pad sensors that we'd like to exploit. But Daniele, you can yeah, explain. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, okay. can hear you. So here, here, first of all, we have a very sensitive uh, force sensor, the blue one you see here. So this one is very sensitive. You can see in the monitor, you, I, I'm barely touching the sensor, and so it's providing a stable signal of the pressure and we are going to use this signal in order to provide feedback to the user of any tiny contact forces uh, occurring when we manipulate objects especially in fine manipulation so we are using this device it is a wearable haptic device using a voice coil actuator the kind of actuator is also very important i'm going to show you that just touching the finger i have the plate of the actuator going in contact with my finger pad and it has to be linear and uh, uh, wide bandwidth actuator in order to provide a good quality haptic feedback. And we believe this is uh, uh, critical in fine manipulation. We have to sense how we grasp object and uh, 
uh, be sensitive also to contact thresholds and the slips of the, object, of, of the objects in the hands. So I'm showing you this setup on the desktop. We are going to integrate it in the final setup you've seen before, uh, using also a sensor that are already um, embedded into the Azura hand, the left hand you've seen before. And um, okay, if you have any question, I'm, uh, I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great it's, point. Uh, showing the back durability of the of the sensor and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for that demonstration. And by the way, to those of you who are watching this webinar, feel free to type in your, any of your questions you have into the Q and A, and we're happy to read them live and uh, talk to Team Santa Ana about any questions you might have, and uh, provide some live answers there. So with these robotic, with this gripper, you mentioned that this one of these sensors is already in the Azura hand. Um, are there going to you are are there plans to integrate more of these to give a full array of of fingertip sensing in the robotic hands, or do you oh, yeah. it just on the gripper? Uh, no, okay. With the Azura hand, it's uh, we are going to implement more. There is a one at the one finger, but we can distribute them more on uh, different fingers. And uh, on the operator side, we are going to use this device wearable and to implement, to implement a, a version with the tracker in place of the handles you have seen uh, the operator was using uh, right now. And uh, so yes, it should be distributed on different fingers, at least uh, thumb, index, uh, and uh, middle finger, at least three. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. yeah, that's a really important uh, integration, you know, making sure that uh, the operator is, a bill, is able to sense whatever object it is. And you mentioned kind of having the right amount of pressure for an object. Um, is there anything that would indicate, you know, let's take the example of that, that cup that you just had. Um, the, the user presumably would be able to, to feel that pressure in such a way that it wouldn't crush the cup, but it would hold it with the right amount of tension. Is that correct? Yeah, sure, precisely. Especially the contact threshold is very important. I can show you. I don't know if you are able to see also the graph on the screen. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I just did the task. So here, the tiny pressure on the cup is enough for the signal to be uh, read by the sensor and, and to be provided by the user. So at the moment, uh, the actuator is pressing my finger. If I just remove this cup, you've seen the small movement. So even those tiny forces are very important to be rendered to the, to the operator especially the contact threshold, but also then the modulation of the pressure for uh, uh, more complex grasping. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and just out of curiosity, how similar would you say that the sensation is for you? You know, obviously the tactile feel of a cup is gonna feel different to your own fingertips, but the actual pressure that you feel back on the, uh, on the device, how similar would you say that is to actually holding a cup? Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, optics is a huge uh, set of uh, cues and uh, sensations. So we are providing just one. It is the pressure. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, given that, uh, it's uh, very similar. So the actuation here, due to the linearity of the sensor, of the of the sensor and also of the actuator, is uh, comparable to uh, real grasping. But of course, this is just one optic cue we are providing to the user. So just. Uh, the contact with the plate and the pressure. Uh, there are uh, several others that would be great to integrate in one device, but uh, uh, there are really a huge set of different haptic cues that uh, could be integrated. We are uh, just exploring which one is the more critical one to be felt in order to operate and to provide uh, informative haptic feedback. Not only, not only realistic, but informative, yeah, in order to. Uh, to to accomplish uh, manipulation tasks of course yeah of course there are a lot of different ways that we sense when we're gripping something or just holding on to something so yeah. it seems like what you what you've devised so far is enough to uh, you know to confirm with the users you know, with with his or her brain that you know i am gripping something even though the tactile feel may not match there's actually something indicating that you are holding something and that's enough to indicate that you're actually, you know, unmanipulating an object. Well, will you have more than one of those on the operator side? Yeah, yeah. At the moment, uh, I mean, in the setup, uh, we have we are just using a handle right now that is sensorized in pressure. But we have uh, 
no feedback at the moment with the exoskeleton used in before. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, several devices we, we can use. For example, here we have uh, an uh, exoskeleton for the hand. I'm just uh, showing you this one uh, could be worn on this hand. We are going, however, to integrate those uh, optic devices on a more uh, compliant device with respect to the rest of the exoskeleton. So we have already different technology in order to do that. We are just developing a new uh, kind of uh, hand tracker with uh, those uh, actuators in order to be the best to be match matched with the existing exoskeleton uh, or the full, full arm exoskeleton. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There will be a new device in order to integrate this with the exoskeleton there. Yeah. So this is just to share, uh, let's say, our vision in the sense that uh, we'd like to uh, emphasize that also the quality of haptic perception is relevant for the experience. So, the, of course, uh, integrating all technologies and providing an ergonomic experience, uh, natural experience to the human is uh, the challenge. So trying to simplify all the interface and keep it simple from the level of user experience. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good balance to find, is making sure that you have that experience that's enough to operate in a remote capacity, providing that experience that feels you know, actual and real but also making it simple enough that it's operable is a really good, important thing to consider. So as we've seen so far, there are a lot of components that go into an avatar system, you know, front facing, there's just a robotic hand, but beneath that, there's a lot of components within it, you know, including the haptic technologies, all of the, just the basic electronic hardware that needs to be protected. Um, you know, with that said, avatar systems are a very complex integration of a lot of technology. What would you say, Antonio, are some of the most important components that will make a successful robotic system like this? Yeah, uh, I mean, of course, uh, uh, it depends on the side. Uh, we can evaluate from, as I was saying before, from the user experience, perception experience from uh, the user that is remotely transfer embodied into the avatar. And so we think that, of course, uh, while vision technologies, you know, are at very highest level of development, of course, uh, it is important then provide uh, to us haptic and hearing feedback. Uh, we are a little bit behind uh, about uh, smell rendering because on that, what we are considering as the last feature to integrate in our architecture. Then on the other side, from the point of view of user that are interaction with the interacting with the robots, this is also a very relevant aspect because this is a collaborative robot. And so as Marco was showing, uh, for instance, uh, hands are very relevant because the robot should manipulate and interact with the human uh, objects. So it should have shape that are capable to do that and are perceived as human-like also by other persons but also the idea of having sensors on the robot, like we are thinking to integrate robot skins. We have other uh, relevant persons in the group, like uh, uh, we have Professor Oddo, that is also in our team, uh, that is uh, developing some robotic skins, so that in principle, you can also touch the robot and transfer the feeling or any way stop the robot in case it's doing some movements that is unwanted, transfer some, let's say, uh, information to the remote user, even uh, using, uh, let's say, uh, the body as a mean of transfer. And of course, for the part of uh, uh, mobility, uh, we were now relying on a uh, uh, wheeled mobile base. And uh, probably Luca and Andrea can uh, show now some more features. And of course, this is a limitation because we cannot uh, move in some conditions, like if you have stairs or uneven terrains. But on the other side, uh, it can be very simple to be controlled by the remote operator and can have um, uh, highly maneuverability uh, since the solution that we are relying on has four degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, sorry, three degrees, of, three degrees of freedom, so it can 
what translate and rotate. So I think also having uh, um, uh, all of these uh, possibility will simplify the task, in particular when you have to orient uh, the body of the avatar with respect, let's say, to a table or to, any, or to a person or to a part of the environment. So of course, uh, you should imagine that we will have a cover mounted on the top of the base and all the upper body trunk that now is uh, remotely uh, displayed. Well, I have two questions for you on that. First of all, how are you controlling um, the, the wheeled base here? And how are you gonna integrate the SLAM technology navigation you talked about with the operator controls? Yeah, there are, uh, I mean, our first uh, approach will be that uh, the operator can take full control in this case, it might use pedals, let's say, uh, to control. Uh, we already have projects in which we were using a, a sort of pedals in order to control the movement. And on the other side, the operator can have some high level functions in which uh, it can select, for instance, a location in the room, and then the robot will reach uh, autonomously the, the place where he has to go. And of course, uh, sensors on board can be used anyway to keep safety level high. So in case uh, you command uh, a position in which there is a risk of contact with a human or with uh, some other object, uh, all the sensors, artificial vision sensor, will prevent this. That's, uh, that's and um, I also have another question. You, you know, you said uh, you've got a lot of human qualities in in your system when it all comes together with the hands. And you um, also have said you're going to put the upper body trunk on the on the wheeled base. Um, what plans do you have for like a face or something that the operator can uh, control to share with the recipient on the other end? Do you have plans for yeah, that? Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, an interesting uh, question. Uh, our uh, group of students has been working on uh, the design aspect of the uh, final avatar. And so we have now a nice rendering of uh, uh, a possible uh, human-like avatar. And uh, at, at this stage, we'd like to that the robot has some human face-like uh, uh, shape. So we will have cameras integrated inside um, uh, let's say a special design head. On this probably Andrea uh, can uh, add something because he's been part of the group work. Andrea and Luca can add something on uh, these aspects of design. Yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, it's not our top priorities right now, the, the, inter the, the face part, but we, we have a prototype on, on the computer, you know, we, we, we draw on, uh, on the CAD uh, a model of, uh, of the head. So I think that it will uh, we'll wait on that until we have uh, a full prototype with the trunk and uh, uh, we have full uh, maneuverability and control of the robot. It's, uh, when it's uh, everything working as we want, I think we'll, uh, we'll implement uh, the head. But right now it's something I, I don't think it's our top priority, and I don't think it should be. So I don't know if you want to add something about that. Thank you. I would like to highlight that, yes, probably, let's say, mobile uh, robots uh, are not similar to you. It's not uh, what you would expect, probably, from an avatar. But at this stage of technology, probably, is quite uh, a reliable solution for us to use this mobile base and we have all the movements we need uh, for, for the user and uh, from the user interface we can uh, move the trunk in any directions and we can orientate it and this, these uh, movements are independent and so we are, we are satisfied with this choice. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, so Luca, I'm noticing that you're using a game controller at the moment to manipulate this robotic base. Um, I'm gonna switch the view back over to that robot. If you could give us a few more, uh, show us a few more capabilities of what that 
what that base is doing and then also maybe talk us through how that uh, the control might be integrated into the full operator system. Um, you know, would you plan to use just the same joystick mechanism or is there some other thing that you might integrate to ensure that uh, just the one operator system can move the base? Yeah, so as you can see right now, I'm using this joystick. So I'm moving the, the mobile robot with the left stick. Uh, I can do a movement to the right and on the left and front, back or any direction. And with the right stick, I can rotate it. And I can combine these this two commands as I, as I wish, as I want. And mm -hmm. probably on the user interface, uh, so you, you cannot use a joystick because your, hand, uh, your hands are already doing something else. So uh, we are going to use a pedal board. And, uh, I think that the, the best solution uh, would be to have like a pedal board with a two axis pad for the for the translation and uh, and another pad for the for the rotation uh, maybe also to reorientate uh, a camera so we can use these four axes uh, uh, three for moving the the base uh, and another one maybe to reorientate the camera and to let's say the the, the vertical uh, the vertical angle of, uh, of the camera so probably i think we we will go for this one yeah it's a great idea to have the pedals there because you know, we're used to being able to manipulate pedals mm -hmm. in our automobiles and things so um Given that your hands are busy, <laughs> it's very good to <laughs> implement the navigation as a pedal device. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that that's it. our best solution because you know right now the the game controller is only is here because it's uh, the first thing we were able to to use to make it move. So in the following days, I think we are gonna try to control it with uh, a pedal board, but I don't think that that's a big deal, you know, we we think it will go pretty smoothly. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you both for that demonstration. You know, it sounds like you have three distinct components, or rather two perhaps at this point, where, you know, you have that mobile base, and then what we've seen already today is the telerobot system with the two arms, both of your robotic hands that are connected to it. So you have two distinct components that are coming together to uh, ensure that then you then have a, a uh, mobile avatar. I'm curious too, what we've seen so far from the demonstration was, you know, you're sitting next to the, the, uh, the robotic system. Uh, Daniele, I believe, is sitting just very close to that. Um, have you tested it from a certain distance? How far away are you able to manipulate this system? Yeah, I don't know whether Francesco wants to answer on this because it's really working on or uh, is developing some algorithms dealing with time delay. So uh, we tested already not this architecture, but uh, uh, a similar one uh, in uh, long distance. Not lot distance. I mean, uh, uh, in uh, not kilometers. I mean, uh, uh, in different locations. And uh, some of, of the issues uh, related to unreliable uh, data transmissions require special algorithms for preserving energy transmission. Francesco can tell something on that, probably. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, as Antonio was saying, I'm working actually on the stability and the performances of teleoperation architecture in, uh, in, in terms of also of, of time delay. Uh, as you were saying, one of the main problem is the distance uh, between uh, the operator uh, suit and, uh, the slave op and the slave robot. Actually, uh, we tested our architecture with uh, this same slave uh, in the Centauro project uh, in which we, had, we have also uh, a quite big distance between uh, the two platforms. So uh, 
using Wi-Fi, it was uh, stable uh, even without passivating the architecture. To guarantee stability, we, uh, we are intentional to uh, implement uh, the time domain passivity approach uh, to handle all uh, kind of uh, delays in the architecture. So this is uh, for us uh, a, pri a priority because uh, we need because the stability must be guaranteed in all situations. So uh, even with if, even if we don't know the time delay, we need to guarantee the stability uh, with techniques like the time domain passivity approach. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, uh, one of the most common approach which is uh, uh, used to guarantee stability because of its simplicity. Because uh, it is uh, in, you don't know. The, you don't need a model of the architecture, so it is uh, simple to be implemented and is very effective. Actually, I'm working on the performance because, uh, as you well know, uh, this kind of approach guarantees the stability but degrading the performance of the manipulator. So we are uh, implementing now new techniques to guarantee the, the performance of the architecture even by guaranteeing the stability. Great. Yeah, so it starts with that stable base of connectivity between the operator and, and the, uh, the, oper the, the robot system. Yeah, yes. it's something like you have a clear path toward, toward ensuring that that's functional over you know, a larger distance than what we're seeing today. Yes, it also depends on uh, the, the channel on which we are uh, communicating. For instance, uh, actually we are communicating using cables and uh, UDP uh, protocols. So it is a stable communication, uh, very, very fast. And uh, we also, we, we performed a, a time delay, which is due to the UR5 uh, architecture. But as you, as you saw, the architecture is stable uh, even in presence of, uh, of the time delay, which is uh, inside the control of uh, UR5. Um, we Francesco, think that you, can, you, you yes. can probably show that you can also interact with the robot since you are there. Yes, uh, maybe someone else, because I have short cable, this is the maximum distance. I can't reach from the... Ah, okay, okay, no, I, I, okay, okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. And this, no, 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 I was saying you, I see you there, but uh, we can show that someone can... Uh, Maybe have... Marco can, uh, can have some interaction with the end. I, I can try, try to... Uh, Marco, Marco, you can, they can see you from this camera. So as you can see, uh, we also have uh, some kind of interaction we also have some kind of interaction with the user, which is a safe interaction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely safe interaction. And uh, the end is just uh, pressing on, uh, on Marco and your five is shaking, but Marco uh, does not feel pain, of course. Or the other thing is that you can showing, showing uh, his pain. You can pass an object like, I mean, like the robot can give a cup of tea or a board in this case, so it can be reciprocal. So you can easily, you can imagine that in a final setup, uh, the humans will be uh, uh, easy, will be interacting easily with the robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, safety is a really important consideration as well. And I saw even while, uh, while, uh, Francesco was speaking, uh, Antonio, that you were there shaking hands with the robot as well, and obviously comfortably doing that. Well, that's an important thing. You know, we talk about human interactions being a really core component of the Avatar X Prize, and so having those safety measures in place that allow, you know, hand-to-hand -hand contact, uh, especially on that just a handshake level, is something that's really important to making a human-to-human -human connection, which is something that we're striving for in the Avatar X Prize. Yeah, for instance, in the hand we have, uh, so here you can see here, the fingers are under actuated, so you can, uh, so if you close the hand, you can see that wrap the, the, the hand without damaging, you know? so you can gently conform the finger on different shape and uh, this uh, you know, safety picture in, in, the, in the hand. Yeah. Yeah, having those safety features is very important. So I believe it's Danielli who's operating this. Um, I'm going to switch back to that view. Tell us a little bit more about what that feels like on your end. Are there any, there's no feedback system currently that is enabling you to sort of yeah. feel that interaction, but that is something that's yeah. planned. Is that right? Uh, you mean the master operator? I think he is Massimiliano that we didn't introduce. Is our. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no problem. Is uh, because he's. Uh, 
in a whole project is doing the operator, so he's a more experienced person. And Massimiliano is a, a professor in mechanical engineering in our lab. And I don't know if someone can, uh, uh, if you can, if you try to talk, Massimiliano, I don't know whether we can hear you. Probably not. But someone can. I can. Uh, I can. I can provide my uh, headphones to to Massimiliano. Okay, very good. Uh, you watch that you are moving also the robot hand, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But... <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you didn't get uh, the question probably. So uh, Colin was asking how it feels because of course now you don't have uh, the feeling at the level of the fingertips. You ha just have the handles so you can provide some uh, uh, in the ah. feeling of your user experience, just if you can say something. Ah, ah. Okay, okay. Well, of course, without the so without the end button only the end in this simplified uh, version, of course, I cannot have the feedback on the fingers, so I just uh, adjusting controlling everything just by uh, looking at what I uh, what I do. Well, actually, when uh, with the arm, with the force feedback, and uh, in the with the I mean uh, uh, final version, so with the index of skeleton, I can uh, perceive the force that uh, the slave is uh, applying to the object, and so actually I can uh, we can see that uh, uh, also the, the object the constraints on the uh, remote environment can. Uh, help me uh, doing the right movement, can help me gu guiding my, uh, my movement, and I can uh, uh, also not to rely only on the visualization system, but also on my, I mean, on the physical uh, feedback. So of course, uh, everything is more natural, and is, uh, uh, and, and lastly is uh, what uh, we, uh, always do in uh, normal life, so that uh, we manipulate objects just uh, uh, by the uh, tactile and kinesthetic feedback and not only looking at what we are doing with our fingers, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm also noticing in your control mechanism, it's just a post that's, that you're holding. Um, is that something that's receiving tension as you grip it to make sure the hand closes? Is that how that functions? Mm. Did you get the question? Yeah, I got, I got the question. Sorry, I switch uh, another microphone. Yeah. So um, we can switch from different grass postures by uh, triggering, for instance, by a long press of the uh, button. We can switch from different uh, grass postures. So in theory, we can uh, use one handle and one input just to open and close, and by using different strategy, you can switch different glass posters. Don't know if I answered the question. Great. Yeah, we just had a question come in that's sort of related to that. So, using that bar shaped hand controller, how many different hand configurations are possible? Yeah, so the, the bar shaped hand controller, if I got the question, it's by using just one input. Mm -hmm. Is it right? So with this yeah. just me input, you, you can open and close, and then, and then, for instance, by a long press of the button, you can switch from different grasp postures. I see. So there's, a, there's not only the handle, but there's also a button in place that can switch between the postures that are programmed in the hand. Okay. So. Yeah. So how many different postures are there that are capable with that controller system? Yeah, right now the hand, the, the knee yeah. hand can have three, three different glass postures, meaning that we can, so we can have a vision, a sort of a, a vertical menu, in which we are switching from the different glass postures. Okay, so we can uh, even use uh, Multiple uh, by switching among the different uh, that are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you said the Mia hand has three that we saw the pinching, 
you know, the cylindrical, and there's also kind of the tighter. Cylindrical, lateral, and pinch. Mm -hmm. There are actually other grass postures, for instance, pointing down, pointing up. So there are different grass postures that can be programmed inside of the hand. Right now, we just programmed three grass postures. I see. Yeah, so there are more that, that it's capable of, but right now we use Gen 3. Yeah, great. Thank you. You know, just a reminder that question did come from uh, the audience. If anybody else has other questions, uh, just before we're a few minutes left in the webinar, if you have questions for Team Santa Ana or anything about their technology or their story, feel free to type them into the Q&A. We'd be happy to answer that. Uh, Antonio, I do have a question as, uh, you know, the team coordinator or leader, you know, when thinking about the next stages of this competition and knowing that uh, the Scuola Santana is something, is a, is a place that has done a lot of robotics work in the past and will all, I'm, I'm sure, continue to do so. You know, aside from winning the grand prize of the Avatar X Prize, what would you consider or how would you describe success for your team at the end of the competition in a couple of years. Sorry, uh, your question is how you, uh, what we consider a measure of success for yes. our team. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, for us, we already, we, uh, we had uh, also in past the dream of build uh, a telepresence system where you can really feel embodied uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, movies show so you feel really embodied in this avatar so first we will be happy if we can uh, achieve uh, the full integration of this capability uh, uh, and this will be already a very very a nice result for us and then uh, as, um, as a second point um, we'd like also to uh, exploit these uh, to um, spread uh, this concept of telepresence to a wider community. Uh, probably now during the COVID emergency, uh, there's been more interest about these uh, technologies of telepresence, uh, but until now their potential use to me has been underestimated. So I think that uh, the second challenge for us would be to spread the relevance of this technology to a wider community and public audience. And of course, making also available uh, uh, out of our laboratory. So technology that can be used in, uh, for instance, uh, of course, this technology in, in current configuration is uh, still expensive, but after the proof of concept, we will know also how to go in order to uh, exploit this technology for a, a more widespread use. So how to simplify the technology. An example was the one of uh, wearable haptics. So using this fingertip device is a way, a standard a way to simplify the level of uh, uh, haptic feedback with more reliable technology. While on artificial hands, all uh, our group led by Marco is already ahead because they already uh, did a lot of steps to simplify and to reach a generation of hands that can already be used by uh, amputees and uh, because they are reliable, cost affordable, and so on. So also cost affordability is a, a challenge on which we, uh, we aim to reach as well. Yeah, so you have a number of goals that you're working toward within and without of the Avatar X Prize. Those are all really excellent ways that you can apply this technology, you know, driving down cost and making sure that they're available to those people that need them down in, or in the future. You know, we really appreciate your thought into that and obviously the goals that the school is striving for really align well with, with what's going on with the Avatar X Prize. So thank you very much for that response. Well, everyone, we are out of time for today's session. And so on behalf of the Avatar X Prize, I'd like to thank all of Team Santa Ana for, their, uh, for taking the time today to join us and give us a closer look at their technologies and what their team has been working on. It's really been a pleasure speaking with Antonio and their full team at Santa Ana. So Antonio, before we sign off, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I just wish to thank you all for the initiative and also the today call. Uh, it's a nice 
best way uh, to be live and share the experience with other people. And uh, so we sell, uh, we, we, we send a, a goodbye from all the team group. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Antonio. And to the rest of the team at Santa Ana, it's been great to see your tech demonstrations and to hear you talk about the work that you've been putting into uh, the build of this avatar system from the, the mobile base all the way up to the full robot and the, uh, the, de the dexterous hands that you've, uh, that you've constructed. So thank you again. Uh, everyone listening, this has been the third installment in the series of Meet the Teams webinar interviews. If you have questions about these interviews, you're welcome to email us at avatar at xprize.org. If you want to learn more about Team Santa Ana, you can visit their website at santaanapisa.it. And uh, you can visit avatar.xprize.org to learn more about our competition and uh, to view the list of qualified teams that are also in the competition. The next installment of this series is coming up at the end of July on the 30th, and we'll be speaking to Team Avatar Quest, who is based in, uh, on the West Coast here in the United States. So be on the lookout for more information soon so you can mark your calendars. Until then, we are wishing you well from Los Angeles and hope that you uh, have enjoyed today's session. We wish you the best and uh, hope that you're staying healthy and safe and this time. So until we meet again, enjoy the rest of your afternoons, evenings, and mornings and take care. Thank you.